I'm Bill Castle, and this is Free Expression. This program is all about conveying the Christian message from a Catholic point of view and defending the liberty which makes it possible to do that. We talk with creative, interesting people encouraging Catholic writing, planning an important faith event, and reaching young people for Christ by answering basic questions. Join us, sit back, and enjoy some free expression. Today's evangelists are well-educated, well-groomed, technically savvy young people. They speak the language of pop culture and current style, and they're not afraid to wear their faith on their sleeves or to proclaim the good news of Jesus confidently and in full voice. A perfect example of today's young evangelists is the crew at Catholic Truth, a Connecticut-based ministry that's gaining wide attention through its seminars and retreats as well as its extensive online outreach and apologetics. Brian Mercier heads up that team, and he's with us now. Brian, how did this apostolate come to be? In short, God changed my life many years ago. Uh, I was uh, always Catholic, but I went astray and started dressing in black and was angry, and my mother ended up sending me to a Catholic college. Franciscan University, which changed my life. Hmm. I ended up wanting just to tell everybody about Jesus because he just transformed me so radically and just shared with me his love more than I could experience in a hundred lifetimes. And I think that was the beginning call of my ministry. But over the years, I was a religious education director, CCD teacher, high school teacher. But recently, over the last four years, I felt like God was calling me to spread the message around the world. And so about four years ago, with 400 YouTube subscribers, I started Catholic Truth. I decided to try to make it work for one year, and uh, I did a lot of work on it, and we went to 6,000 subscribers, and then to 15,000 the next year, 30,000 the next year, and now we're at about 50,000. And uh, we reach millions of people all around the world through YouTube, podcasts, social media, speaking, retreats, you name it. We just want to reach as many people on as many platforms as possible. Yeah, you go out and do parish missions and uh, all sorts of seminars yes, we as well. Yes, we do parish missions and uh, confirmation retreats and conferences, you name it, we do it all. Historically, my focus has been on young people, especially through confirmation retreats, Catholic high school retreats, youth group retreats, and that sort of thing. But over the years, people have started to ask us to speak to adults as well, and even to train adults on how to reach the youth. We hear a lot about those people who claim to have no religious affiliation. What's your impression? Are young people especially really falling away from the church in in the great numbers that we read about? There is kind of a crisis. Uh, Yeah, I would even say an emergency in many areas where our young people are falling away from the church in droves in their not coming back many times. I mean, I'm in the Hartford Diocese, and our bishop sent out a manual showing just how many people have left the church, how many people don't attend anymore, the crisis of vocations, the crisis of youth. And really, I mean, the churches that I go to, I hardly see any youth anymore. And just speaking to youth, over even the last five years, I've noticed even more of a de-evolution, you know, a falling away from the faith. I mean, it was bad before COVID, but now it's really difficult. Many of these kids that I speak to don't even know if God exists. They're not even sure if Jesus is real. They don't know why they're Catholic. They don't believe the Bible. They think a lot of these things are outdated and superstitious. Science disproves religion, and it all stems from a laxity of falling away from the faith. It's not being lived at home many times. It's not being passed on by the parents. And then we unfairly put all that burden on religious education programs and say religious education isn't doing enough, when in fact, it's the parents' job to pass on the faith, and that ball has been dropped for decades in many areas. So when I talk to kids, I, the first thing I ask them is, how many of you believe in God? Sometimes up to half of the kids I speak to, like 100 kids in a group, will raise their hand and say they're not sure if God exists. So why are we teaching them about confirmation and the Pope and the Catholic Church and all these things, which are great and necessary, but they, I feel like we need to in some ways go back and reach them where they're at. They, many of these kids don't even know the basics. I gave a talk in New Jersey once on the miracles of Jesus and how he changed people's lives and you know just the great man that he was, and everybody looked bored at my talk. 
And so I went up to them after the talk and I said, you know, did you like the talk? And be honest with me. If you didn't, I can change it up. I just want you to be honest. And I said, no, no, we love the talk. We just never heard that before. It was interesting. So we were just really thinking about it. I said, I literally gave them the basic message of our faith of Jesus and miracles. And a lot of them said they never heard it. If these kids were attending your program, I assume that they are coming from church. They go to Mass. Uh, they are nominally Catholic. What aren't they hearing from the pulpit? Exactly. And uh, I mean, I used to be a religion teacher, and these kids told me that it was their least favorite class. They were completely bored by religion. And I didn't know really what to do with that because they were like, this doesn't mean anything. What doesn't get us to college? And so even when I taught CCD, the, the kids themselves would come up to me and they would be like, you're cutting into my sleeping time. You know, this is going to be the worst time ever. And the kids literally told me this to my face. Seventh graders, they lined up and told me how much they didn't want to be there. So I finally smacked the table in the classroom really hard. And I said, I don't even believe in God. You guys actually believe in God? And uh, I said, prove to me that your God exists. And they said, well, the Bible. I said, well, how do you know the Bible wasn't made up by some man who just wanted to scare people? And they said, I don't know. Uh, they said, well, how else did we get here? I said, well, let me think. The Big Bang, the Bouncing Universe, Multiverse, there's a lot of ways we could have come about without God. So every objection they tried to bring up to prove that God existed for the next five minutes, I shot down. And eventually, one kid, you know, shaking his hand, he was like, really scared to ask now, but he's like, well, how do we know God exists? And then I said, finally, good. And they were in my hands for the rest of the year. They loved my class. In fact, they bought rosaries at the end of the year. They bought Bibles. And I met a girl recently who looked me in the eyes and said this was going to be the worst hour of her life. I recently ran into her, and she gave me a relic of a saint. And she said she's practicing her faith very strongly. And uh, this was great because I got to teach them the faith. I got to answer their questions. I got to teach them how to truly pray and connect with God. But so many people don't teach our youth these things, which is why they're falling away. So it sounds like we really need to get down to the basics. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I, I think I'm making a seven-part series on our Catholic Truth YouTube channel on how to reach our youth. And part one was answering our kids' questions. I spoke to some sixth graders yesterday. I was supposed to give a talk, but I ended up fielding questions for one hour, and the kids loved it, the teachers loved it, everyone loved it, and they got so much out of it. These kids are starving. They have so many questions today, and people just don't answer their questions. Like, when I was growing up, I said, Mom, if God's love, why does he send people to hell? Oh, well, he's a mystery. You know, that's, you know, God's a mystery. I used to ask my religious education teachers, well, how did we get here? I mean, science says that, you know, it was through the Big Bang 13.8 billion years ago, but, you know, religion says it was only seven days. Like, how, that, that contradicts. And they said, oh, well, God's a mystery. So they never actually answered my questions. And so if kids don't get their questions answered, they're going to walk away from the faith forever, or they're just going to find them elsewhere. And our culture and our society is rapidly spoon-feeding them with garbage every single day and killing them. So we need to not only answer their questions, we need to arm them with the knowledge that's not only just going to help them to find God, but also be able to defend and keep their faith long term. You guys do have an active outreach that involves uh, answering questions online and countering arguments against God and all of that. Tell me about that aspect of your work. We were reaching a quarter of a million people a month on TikTok, and we have a very small account that's growing. These are the people that aren't going to darken the doorway of a church. They're not going to go to confession, so we need to go where they are. We need to preach the faith in a way that makes sense. We need to answer their questions in a way that's rational, logical, and charitable. And I can tell you from experience that having a good online presence and making good content brings people home. I have kids as young as 6, 7, 8, 11 years old watching our YouTube channel and liking it. We have kids uh, who are teenagers who want to convert to the Catholic faith from other religions. And we have people literally flooding into the Catholic Church through our channel from all different religions. And even Catholics who are going to leave the Catholic faith, they're staying Catholic because of our channel and because of the information that we've given them. So how do people find out more about your work? 
Well, they can look at our website at catholictruth.org. They can also find us at the Catholic Truth Podcast or just hashtag Catholic Truth, TikTok, Instagram, Pinterest, Twitter, Facebook groups. Catholic Truth, Brian Mercier. Thank you very much for telling us about this. You're uh, right out there on the front lines doing some important work. It is my pleasure. Thank you for having me. A few years back, I was honored to receive the Catholic Arts and Letters Award for my novel about the family of Jesus, My Brother's Keeper. The Cala, or as it's also called, the Lilly Award, is given by the Catholic Writers Guild, an organization that encourages development of contemporary literature with a Catholic focus and flavor. It's a wonderful group that nourishes aspiring writers and that's having a positive influence increasing the Catholic presence in religious book publishing and communication. The current Guild president is here right now. She's Carolyn Astfalk, a Catholic author of considerable repute herself, as well as a book blogger and reviewer. Carolyn, thanks for being with us. Oh, thanks so much for having me. Give us some background on the Guild and its various programs, would you? Sure. The Catholic Writers Guild was started by a group of dedicated Catholic writers that wanted to have some camaraderie and some professional, I guess you'd say, collaboration um, back in, I think it was 2009. It was like the the end of the first decade there in the 2000s, and it's grown. We have more than 500 members, uh, mostly from the United States, but from other countries around the world as well. And we provide opportunities for networking and fellowship and spiritual growth, as well as professional conferences, both an online one and a live in-person one, retreats, critique groups, and all kinds of other sort of things we're trying to build to, to help Catholic authors, whether they write fiction, nonfiction, books, web content, anything, to grow in, in their craft and also spiritually and find that kind of fellowship that supports them in their vocation. Now, you also give a seal of approval, which is a real help to bookstore operators and dealers. Uh, Talk about that a little bit, if you would. The seal of approval is designed for books that would not be able to receive an imprimatur from their diocesan office. So mainly that's fiction books. And what the seal is designed to do is give mainly Catholic bookstores a level of comfort in selecting books that they want to put on their shelves, knowing that they are well-written and they are not contrary to the teachings of the Catholic Church. So it's impossible, I would think, for uh, most bookstores to pre-read every item they put on their shelf. So this gives them a level of comfort. We have volunteer evaluators, three to four, for each book that's considered that will read for typos and grammar and basic quality, as well as the Catholic orthodoxy of the book. And then as long as they pass that with a majority of evaluators approving them, they can have that designation that they have, the seal of approval. It's it's not exactly an award, but it is um, a designation for quality and content that should be a reassurance. Yeah, I know that the dealers really do count on that. I mean, just because a book has a priest or a nun character and it doesn't necessarily make it Catholic. Exactly. And there's a whole wide range um, with independent publishing of all kinds of books that are published. And you can't, well, actually, you can't even make a guarantee whether something's traditionally published or independently published of the quality necessarily. So we try to help fill that gap and uh, reassure bookstore owners and others. What about this conference that you've got coming up uh, in Chicago, I believe? We have an annual live conference, and this year it's a little different because in the past we've partnered with the Catholic Marketing Network, and we've loved working with them, but this year we had a different opportunity based on some changing schedules to work with the Association of Catholic Publishers. So our live conference precedes theirs in Chicago this year. It's from May 30th to June 1st, our portion of it, and we have those days filled with a couple of keynote speakers, and then we have different speakers and panels, and we have opportunities for attendees to do chapter critiques with some of our award-winning authors. We have opportunities to have meals with mentors, which is an opportunity to speak with some others who maybe write what you write, who have a lot of experience and knowledge in that area. And then just general, I guess, opportunities to network and to socialize and to meet other writers. So it's, it's a, a great 
great experience. Everyone that I've known that's been to them, myself included, has always come away energized and hopeful and grateful for the opportunity that they've had. Take a couple minutes and tell me a little bit about your own writing. I began writing fiction about 10 years ago, a little more than that maybe, and I had a lot of experience with writing professionally nonfiction or even some newspaper columns when I worked for the Pennsylvania Catholic Conference, but I really didn't focus on writing fiction until I had resigned from there and was home with my children, and I had heard from enough people about this thing called National Novel Writing Month that I decided one month when I my children were little, my husband was traveling a lot, that I could give that a try. So I did a very, very rough first draft of a novel only maybe 50,000 words, but that was enough to get me started on it, writing and rewriting and writing other books. So I have, at this point, five Catholic novels. They are contemporary romance, or I call them theology of the body fiction sometimes when I'm talking to other Catholic uh, readers. And I also have some contributions to anthologies through a group called Catholic Teen Books, which is a group of authors that are joined for mostly for cross-marketing purposes to help people find out about fiction that's designed for Catholic teens and tweens. So I've contributed to those stories as well. What sorts of subjects uh, do you customarily deal in? I tend to write romance that relies heavily on St. John Paul's Second Theology of the Body. So they're very um, contemporary, normal stories, but I think anyone that's aware of the Theology of the Body would be able to see the themes of uh, how you know God has made us with a purpose and our bodies are designed in a way that's made to love and be loved. And so I touch on premarital chastity, marital chastity, pornography, uh, what else did they cover? All those kinds of issues, but they're in the context of what I hope are very relevant stories of second chance romances and all the kinds of tropes that you would see. But I think that I typically enjoy writing ones that have a little more depth and give, give these people something to think about and reflect on a little bit in the safe context of a fictional person's life and the mistakes they made and the lessons they learned. Those are areas that uh, involve some some moral sensitivity and uh, I would imagine a little bit of tact, especially when you're addressing a younger readership. Right, and so most of my novels are more for adults, um, although they're all clean in content, meaning there's never any explicit sexual content, so they could be read by teens, but the characters mainly are adults, young adults. And um, I think even when you mentioned... For different age levels, uh, my one of my most recent novels, All in Good Time, is the one that deals with pornography. And again, it's not anything explicit about it, but one of the things that came through as I was writing it was how it touched on absolutely everyone. It, men and women and even children, the age of exposure on average now I think is 10 years old for pornography. So we live in a culture that's saturated with it, and so it does really affect everybody. Um, but again, that's a novel for adults. My novel that's geared more towards teens, the coming-of-age story, it's called Rightfully Ours, and that deals with teens directly and adopting their own commitment to what the church teaches, what their parents have taught them, and deciding what they believe about moral morality in, um, in sexuality and in their interpersonal relationships. Where can people find out about your writing and maybe uh, find uh, ways of ordering your books? All my books can be found on my website, which is just my name, carolynasfalk.com, and my teen novel, Rightfully Ours. You can find that. We have a site called Catholic Teen Books, and that's filled with books from about uh, 12 to 15 other authors, and they cover a whole wide gamut of topics as well. So you can find some of my work there, some of my own websites, and catholicmom.com, we'll still find some things there, but I've kind of spread myself thin <laughs> over the Internet. And getting back to the Guild, uh, where can people find out about the Guild and its programs, and especially about the upcoming conference? You can just go to catholicwritersguild.org. We're actually working on a whole rebranding and website, which we're very excited about. But everything is still right on our present website. There's information about joining, about all the activities we do, including the live conference, the seal of approval, all that good stuff, and a link to our blog is there as well. Carolyn Astfalk, the Catholic Writers Guild. Thanks for taking time to talk with us. This is all interesting stuff and uh, very important for people who maybe are interested in becoming writers themselves. Thank you very much, Bill. The Eucharist.
Eucharist is so central a part of Catholic worship that we can easily take it for granted. With the lockdowns and restrictions imposed during the coronavirus pandemic, Catholics suddenly found themselves deprived of communion. It was a splash of cold water in the face reminding us how important receiving Eucharist really is in our faith life. That importance is being underscored by an event planned for July of 2024, the 10th National Eucharistic Congress. Joel Stepanek is one of the organizers, and he's here to tell us about this gathering, which will be held in Indianapolis. Joel, thanks for being with us. Uh, give us the lowdown. What's going to happen at the Congress? Who's taking part, and how can people participate? We are so excited for this monumental historic event that has not happened in the United States in over 80 years. The 10th National Eucharistic Congress is happening July 2024 in Indianapolis, and it's going to bring together 80,000 Catholics from across the United States. What's going to happen during those days? What sorts of programs will there be? Of course, there will be keynotes and presentations from Catholic leaders, priests, religious, evangelists, who will present on a variety of topics in a couple of different tracks. There will be a track specifically for youth, uh, teenagers. There will be a track specifically for families, where moms, dads, and their children can encounter the Lord uh, in a unique way as a family and understand what it means to be a domestic church on mission. We'll have a track for clergy, and then a couple of tracks that focus on the lady, ministry leaders, folks who are ready to be sent out on mission, and just any Catholic who wants to encounter the Lord through the Eucharist. So there will be talks, there will be breakouts specific on different aspects of our life as Catholics and what it means to be sent out on mission. And then around that, there will be massively beautiful liturgy every single day, uh, upwards of 7 to probably 12 or 13 liturgies a day. And then on the last day, of course, a large liturgy where everybody will participate. We're very excited about that final moment and that final day. Uh, We have uh, several opportunities for prayer, um, the rosary, chapels where the Blessed Sacrament will be exposed uh, for prayer and devotion, and then multiple areas set up for the Sacrament of Reconciliation. Uh, And in addition to that, we're looking at different experiences that include art displays and installations, concerts, entertainment, uh, and opportunities for people just to gather and share and grow in community. Recently, there have been several surveys that have really revealed some some pretty significant gaps in Catholics' religious understanding, particularly on the question of Eucharist. I remember reading one recently that uh, talked about a, a surprising percentage of Catholics who either don't understand what the Eucharist is all about or, or have deep doubts about its authenticity. Are any of the programs going to address those kinds of problems? It will, and I think it's going to address those problems from a standpoint of what do we do as Catholics who believe and understand what the Eucharist is in renewing that belief. I, as people come to the Congress, I believe that a lot of the folks who will make that trip to Indianapolis and that pilgrimage to Indianapolis are probably asking some of the same questions you and I are. You know, how, What do I do? How do I help people, my friends, my family, Catholics who have fallen away, understand the great gift that is the Eucharist and the spiritual poverty in which they're living absent of the Eucharist or separated from the Eucharist? And so a lot of the programming will address how do we talk about and understand the Eucharist with other people? How do we grow in our love and our devotion and our understanding of the Eucharist? Sometimes we have we know what the Church teaches, but maybe we don't understand the deeper theology underneath that, so that when somebody says to us, come on, you Catholics really believe that that turns into Jesus' body and, and, and blood, that's crazy, that's cannibalism, that's wild. How do I explain that to others? And so we'll cover some of that content as well. It's really trying to equip Catholics who love the Lord and who know Jesus in the Eucharist in their understanding of the sacrament in a deeper way and their ability to go out and to share that. This is the 10th Congress, so obviously there's a track record here. What's, what's some of the history? How did this whole thing get started years ago? There was a greater understanding of Eucharistic Congresses in the United States where it was a more frequent event in the early 1900s and late 1800s, where oftentimes at the early Congresses, it'd be clergy would get together, priests would get together, and they would read academic papers on the Eucharist. Uh, sometimes they would produce a document. And then as the Congress grew, and evolved, uh, Congresses would continue to be held throughout the United States, and laity started to be involved, families started to be involved and invited. 
And we had a pretty good tradition of Eucharistic conferences in the United States right up until the end of World War II. And we had uh, Congress at the end of World War II and the years after that, and then really kind of fell out of rhythm for Eucharistic Congresses and this moment where people would be invited to learn about the Eucharist or academics would present papers, um, times for worship and uh, large masses and Eucharistic processions uh, that kind of, for whatever reason, uh, I'm not exactly sure what that reason is, we kind of fell out of practice with that. There was another event in the mid-70s that was similar to the style of a Eucharistic Congress, but wouldn't have been considered a necessarily a national Eucharistic Congress. It's been over 80 years, really, uh, by the time we have this next Congress, since we have done something like this. Tell me something about the uh, physical arrangements. Uh, It's going to be at the Lucas Arena in downtown Indianapolis. How do you get there? How do you make a reservation? What are the costs? Uh, Give me the rundown on all of that. At Lucas Oil Stadium, which is where the Indianapolis Colts play, the Indiana Convention Center is also an entire area next to the Colt Stadium, uh, Lucas Oil, where we will be having breakouts and sessions and a place where you can connect with different ministries. And that whole real downtown area is a place that we are going to converge upon and make Catholic Central in Indianapolis. Folks can find more information about the Congress at Eucharistic Congress. Dot org, and that will list out uh, a variety of ticket prices. We have special pricing for families uh, and children. There is uh, special pricing also for groups. So as an individual, an individual event pass is $375. But as you bring more people with you, because this is best enjoyed with a group, particularly a group from your parish, those prices go down. And then if you are a family that would like to come, uh, it's 299 for an event pass for a parent and then $99 per child. And that's an event pass for the full five days. That includes all of the evening sessions, access to all of the breakouts, the different experience areas, and then the various tracks that we'll be offering as well. Can uh, people make room reservations and that sort of thing through that website? Once somebody registers, you'll receive information on special hotels that we have blocked for this particular event, um, and then options for some non-hotel housing as well. And so those are things that we provided some flexibility for, for pilgrims, as folks may have different preferences for arrangements they would like to make. But upon registration, all of that information will be sent along with confirmation of your registration and event path. Joel Stepanek, the 10th National Eucharistic Congress. Uh, So they want to go to eucharisticcongress.org. Joel, thanks an awful lot for telling us about this. It sounds like it's going to be an exciting event. We are very excited, Bill. Thank you for having me on. Be with us next time when we explore other aspects of religious communication and look deeper into the great Christian heritage of free expression. Free Expression with Bill Castle is a production of Good Shepherd Catholic Radio and Company Publications, where good books, good music, and good radio are always good company. Dan Curris provided technical assistance, theme, and incidental music are by Dan Adam. The program was produced and directed by Bill Castle. This is Good Shepherd Catholic Radio.